So now let's switch it up. And instead of talking about iron overload, we're going to talk about Wilson's disease, which is essentially copper overload. So this, like hemochromatosis, is also an autosomal recessive disorder. And this it results in deficient copper transport in our liver cells. And what's going to happen if we have deficient copper transport, it's the copper will end up accumulating in our liver, cause damage, and it'll be released into the bloodstream and also affect other tissues. This is caused by a defect in the ATP7B gene on chromosome 13. And I remember that this ATP7B gene affects chromosome 13 because if you look at my mnemonic here, you can see that it looks like ATP7B, but it's actually 13. So you can just look, if you combine the one and the three like I did here, it can show you your ATP7B gene. And while we're here, I just wanted to emphasize that there's another condition that they're gonna want you to know about for step one and level one. Um, so I'm not gonna go over this in great detail, but my quiz question is, which disease is related to a defect in the ATP7A gene? And that is actually Menke's disease. And it's an X-linked recessive. And I always remember that by the K in Menke's kind of already looks like an X to help me remember that's an X-linked uh, disorder. And we mentioned that Wilson's disease is caused by a copper defective copper re regulation in liver cells, while Menke's disease is actually caused by defective copper regulation in non-liver cells. And so you're gonna get a developmental delay, failure to thrive, as well as this classic uh, brittle hair or kinky hair and this usually shows up on tests. I, I don't remember seeing a question on Mankey's that didn't have this specifically. But we'll go back to Wilson's disease. I just wanted to point out that there is a similar disease that has you know, a somewhat similar mechanism where it's related to copper. <clears throat> but moving back to Wilson's disease, I wanna talk about that ATP7B uh, in, in a little bit more detail. So that enzyme can serve two primary functions in hepatocytes. The first thing it can do is it can take all that copper and it can actually package it into this transport protein called ceruloplasmin. And once it's packaged into ceruloplasmin, you can successfully absorb that into the bloodstream. The other thing it can do is it can take some of the excess copper that you might have and it can package those into vesicles and that, that can all be excreted into the bile and out of the body. So as you can probably already see what's gonna happen, if you have a defect in that ATP7B gene and you don't have enough of that enzyme anymore, that protein, what's gonna happen is that that copper can accumulate in hepatocytes. And remember from hemochromatosis, we talked about how all that excess iron can undergo a Fenton reaction and cause free radical damage. What's gonna happen here is that somewhat similar in that copper will accumulate and it can also undergo a reaction to cause free radical damage. And ultimately, if the damage is severe enough, those hepatocytes that you have will start to die off and their membranes will they'll start to break and you're gonna have leakage of all that free copper into your bloodstream. So let's talk now about what normal copper regulation looks like. So I mentioned that there's two primary functions to this ATP7B protein. And we're, we're gonna go over each of these functions. So let's assume that copper is absorbed into a hepatocyte. Normally what happens is that our ATP7B gene will package some of that copper up into ceruloplasmin, and then that can be successfully released into our bloodstream and then into tissues that need that copper. The second thing it can do is it can package up some of that excess copper that's not required. It puts those into vesicles and those can be released into the bile and ultimately excreted. So in Wilson's disease, we still have that copper being absorbed by the hepatocyte, but this time that ATP7B gene is non-functional. And so both of these, these functions are also not gonna work anymore. So instead of having this copper 
neatly packaged into ceruloplasmin, it's going to be free floating in your hepatocyte. And similarly, instead of this copper free uh, packaged nightly into this vesicle for excretion, that copper too will be out and about within your hepatocyte. And over time, that as that copper accumulates, you're going to have free radicals forming. And so these free radicals can damage your hepatocyte. And once that happens and your hepatocyte doesn't have any more of its structural integrity, some of that copper can leak out into your bloodstream. So how will Wilson's disease present? Again, similar to hemochromatosis, the symptoms for Wilson's disease will just depend on what copper does when it deposits in certain organs. So in the liver, you're going to have, you can have fatigue, abdominal pain, and jaundice. And then ultimately, if that damage is prolonged enough, you will get cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. In the brain, you can get several uh, psychiatric and neurological conditions such as dementia, psych uh, tremor, Parkinsonism. You can get mood disorders as well through this. In the eye, you're going to get these classic uh, Kaiser Fleischer rings in Deschamais membrane of the cornea. So I'm going to show you a Kaiser Fleischer ring. Here is our eye. You notice that there's a dark ring encircling the cornea. This dark ring is this dark ring is not uh, normal, and I've highlighted it there. And that's because all the copper is depositing in a Deschamais membrane of the cornea. And they do want you to know this specific site, this Deschamais membrane. Very very important. And a mnemonic that I thought about with Kaiser Fleischer's ring, I always, to me, Kaiser Fleischer sounds like some old, like European, like almost like an Austrian empire. It sounds like some sort of empire. And so I always assume that they're known for their uh, copper rings and all the wealth that comes with that. So that's how I remember Kaiser Fleischer rings are associated with copper deposition. And, I, and that'll help me remember that it's a, a complication of Wilson's disease specifically. In the kidney, you can get renal disease, something called Fanconi syndrome. And in the red blood cells, you can also get hemolytic anemia. These two I mentioned because they are on a couple of the study aids that I went through when I was making this PowerPoint. I will say these are much, much, much lower yield. You definitely need to know this uh, Kaiser Fleischer rings. You definitely need to know cirrhosis. And I would know that it causes a, a wide variety of neurologic and psych symptoms. These three right here are much more uh, relevant on test day than these two. So when we talk about the laboratory findings for Wilson's disease, it can be tempting to simply measure the serum copper levels. And that's kind of what we did in hemochromatosis. We measured the serum iron levels and they were elevated. And that, that was one of the markers we were able to use. Well, I'm going to go over why that doesn't always work. And it's actually better to measure their serum uh, ceruloplasmin levels. That's the best test you can do, uh, the best lab test you can do, at least, to diagnose Wilson's disease. If you measured their urinary copper, that it will usually be elevated. Their serum co copper is variable, and that's why we can't really use serum copper to check for Wilson's disease, because it might be high or low, depending on uh, if there's an acute flare-up or not. And of course, the gold standard for most of these conditions is a biopsy, and the liver biopsy would show high copper levels. On a test, they're usually looking for you to pick the ceruloplasmin level first, though. You wouldn't want to go straight to a biopsy if, if you're concerned with somebody who might have Wilson's disease. You, the answer they're probably looking for is this they want you to check for a, this serum ceruloplasmin first. And then if you're really suspicious, if, if these come back low ceruloplasmin, high urinary copper, then you could potentially consider a liver biopsy if you think it's necessary. So let's go over these laboratory findings. So the serum ceruloplasmin, we talked about this before, how ATP7B is able to neatly package these copper molecules into ceruloplasmin and those can be released into your blood. If you don't have that ATP7B protein working though, that copper is gonna be free flowing and that ceruloplasmin won't be released into your blood. So you're gonna end up with low ceruloplasmin levels.
urinary copper, normally what's going to happen is that if you have this copper that's neatly packaged in ceruloplasmin, like it should be, if it tries to get excreted, it's not going to because it's already part of this bigger entity. However, if you have will uh, if you have Wilson's disease and you have copper that ends up leaking out, let's say after that hepatocyte gets damaged and some copper leaks out, now that free copper is it can easily go through the kidneys and be excreted. So you're going to have increased urinary copper. Serum copper is a little bit more confusing. And th the reason why we cannot use our serum copper reliably to measure whether somebody has Wilson's disease is that the, the levels will differ depending on where in the process you are. So let me explain that. Let's say you have an acute flare up where you have a lot of your hepatocytes have this free radical damage a lot, and it's causing inflammation and hepatocyte uh, injury or death. And during this acute setting, a lot of copper is gonna spill out into your blood. So if you measured that all that copper, it would be elevated naturally. Over time though, as that copper you know, gets excreted in your kidneys, or let's say you've kind of reached this state where a lot of your hepatocytes have already died and you don't have that many hepatocytes dying and releasing a ton more copper into your bloodstream, you could end up with this situation where you don't have too much copper anymore left over in your blood. And when we actually measure copper on laboratory studies, in this case, let's say this is somebody who has normal uh, ceruloplasma, normal ATP7B, it's all packaged nicely. When we measure serum copper, we're actually measuring all of this copper too. So we're measuring the copper that's correctly bound to ceruloplasma. So if we go back to this example that I just mentioned, so this is the example where it's not an acute flare up where a lot of hepatocytes are leaking copper. It's kind of more after that. And you can see here that in this case, if you measure the serum copper, this would actually be decreased compared to what our normal, uh, quote unquote, normal serum copper level would be. So depending on where you are in the disease state, it could be increased or decreased. And that's why we like to use serum ceruloplasm more than serum copper. And of course, if you ever took a liver biopsy, it would show increased copper levels. So moving on to treatment of Wilson's disease, similar to hemochromatosis where we use iron chelators, we're gonna use copper chelators here. And some copper chelators that they want you to know are penicillamine, trientine, and oral zinc. And ultimately, if the damage is severe enough, you might, if they're a candidate for it, the definitive treatment would be a liver transplant. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like, comment, and subscribe for more content.